now would be a really good time to uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> Manitoba passed balanced budget legislation '95, and ours is actually some of the most, uh, I guess you could say, ambitious or uh, uh, ambitious legislation that was put forward and the uh, New Democrats when they came in in 99 uh, came in on a platform they sustained it and in fact they've modified it but they haven't changed it very fundamentally they changed the balancing provision from one year to four years which makes a little more sense but there's no guarantee that business cycles are going to be a four-year cycle like election cycles do. Um, but the basic idea behind it is to uh, I think reflect the notion that taxpayers have is that you're going to try to keep your house in order your fiscal house in order um, and there are a number of ways of doing that. Um, one would be to, to feature some sort of economic statement once a year where you laid out the situation in terms of things like the deficit, like the um, uh, debt to GDP ratio and so on, and talked about where you were going. That's done in the budget, which tends to get buried behind shiny pennies and other diversions. Um, and I think probably uh, it should be done at a different point in the year. But, um, uh, it's not clear to me that, for example, an annual balanced budget uh, measure, which is what most other provinces have, is really a good idea because it has to be backed up with a pretty uh, substantial savings package that really parks a lot of money in a spot where it can't be uh, used in any productive way. So um, I'm not really that keen on the kind of balanced budget legislation most provinces have. I'm also critical of the Manitoba government for essentially whether you say they panicked or whatever, they, they, they suspended the balanced budget legislation and it wasn't at all clear that the depth of the recession and the kinds of measures they could have taken uh, couldn't in fact have allowed them to cope with the, uh, with the recession. And uh, having suspended it, I suspect it led to an opening of the pocketbooks in ways that have uh, probably hurt the re-election chances. That's great, thank you. Did you want to add or add to that? Well, the, for us, the benefit of a balanced budget is ultimately the flexibility that it affords you. Uh, I, I hearken back to uh, the Liberal budgets uh, when they were running surpluses. They were paying down the debt. What's the benefit of paying down the debt? Well, less debt servicing costs for one. So you don't even have to raise taxes, and you're getting more revenue just by the fact you're re the money. You get to keep more of what you're already collecting. But again, it's really that flexibility. You, you have the ability to then dictate where you spend your money. It's not you're constrained because you have limited resources. So that if government wants to make strategic investments because there's, there's a need or they want to go in a certain direction, you have that flexibility. Really, it comes down to as simple as being able to apply it into your own life, right? When you have massive debt, how much flexibility do you have to do things that you need to do? But the minute you're running a you know, your checkbook's balanced and you've paid off your credit cards, then you can start making, uh, you have much greater flexibility and freedom. That's a whole different discussion because obviously, example, when the Liberals were running federally uh, surpluses, then it's a whole different conversation. It says, how do we spend the surplus as opposed to uh, which programs we cut? It's, I'd rather have that discussion. I would love to, to have debates with people about what are we gonna do with all the money above and beyond what we need that's a that's a kind of conversation we need to have. Chris, do you want anything? I mean, I was just going to say exactly what Lauren kind of had said, and that the the best thing about balancing the books is then you have more spend, more money to spend where you want it. You can pick new social programs, and particularly as you were saying, with this budget, it would give them more um, electable ideas, and it would allow them to put out some of those those goodies. And also, it's, help them get it's, it's an opportunity to be slightly less reactive and, and, and much more long-term planning as a result, uh, especially if you have a mandate that you can then implement. Uh, so we're another question coming up. There you go. Question because certainly that was one of the one of the campaign the planks that he had was looking at alternative funding from the city from the province uh, and indeed a, a, a tax for the city. Uh, what, what do you think of that idea? Well, uh, Glenn Murray was the one who pioneered this. Uh, well, didn't pioneer, but he uh, promoted it uh, in, in the Canadian context, and I think he still promotes it but from a different from Toronto, not from Winnipeg. So, uh, you know. The, the cities are creatures of the provinces. They depend on the provinces for 
all their funding. And the provinces depend for a significant amount of their funding on the federal government. And uh, the provinces, in some sense, have have suffered from the federal balancing of the books because the uh, the Martin budgets in the 90s cut uh, a number of transfer payments to the provinces that did, made their made the provinces' life more difficult. Um, and uh, the provinces certainly have had time to adjust to that, but. Uh, with health and education such a significant part of their budgets. Um, it, it, it makes their, their, their situation difficult and things like infrastructure spending uh, are part of the, the remaining third of their budgets, right? So uh, this is where the cities in, the cities in particular uh, suffer, you know, as this filters down from, from the federal government all the way down. And there is no real cities uh, policy uh, at the federal level, even at the provincial level, there's nothing really set out that's very specific about how they're going to deal with, with, the, uh, with the city of Winnipeg, for example. And it would be nice to hear a provincial party come along and actually say that they wanted to give the city a better deal. But I, I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, yeah, well, and I'm not sure how it was the media's fault and all that. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got lost in that argument, but it's fine. Um, I, I mean, for the like, average citizen, we don't care about the bureaucratic process and all that. We just want to get things done. So, and the media also has a lot of power in educating the public. So, and you guys have failed. Tell the truth. All right. Well, we're trying to do the best we can. I know that's for sure. Um, and I mean, it comes from, I guess, some of these different ideas that Shannon was just referring to about the municipal tax um, that was proposed. To, I know other cities around the country, Niagara Falls has one, for example, where they tax people who spend money within the city and that money goes to specific things within that community. It's something that uh, has been proposed before. I would be surprised if this provincial government, after having raised the PST and expanded it the year before that in 2012, would be interested in allowing municipalities to um, then put in their own tax. That seems like yet another tax on a different level that would be surprising, I would think. Um, but, I mean, it's something that everybody would watch. And as far as the putting the 1% PST directly into the city, I know that that's something that I believe the Liberals have promised in their platform. So if it's something that you're interested in seeing, or if it's a policy that you wanted to see, I would suggest you look at what the parties are promising and then go from there and see which one aligns most with what you're liking. With respect to the city's systemic deficit, you have to be careful because there's really no such thing as a systemic deficit at the city. The city, by, by legislation, cannot run a deficit. Right? They always have to get to zero at a minimum. So bit of the public relations as it comes around budgets. Um, I, I will say this though that um, again, and we touched on this in the bold Winnipeg platform, but it really speaks to the province. They're really, and I know you've all heard this line, there's only one taxpayer, I won't go down that road too much. But the idea that we have to kind of get away from robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? That the province is in financial straits. Some of it of its own doing, some of it not of its own doing. They're not in a position to start hiving off big chunks of money to the city. What we need to do is reinvent our revenue model at the municipal level and even to some degree at the provincial level that moves away from uh, this fighting over scraps, turning over every rock, looking for nickels and dimes. At the municipal level, the Chamber advocated through our Bold Winnipeg platform for a discussion a community-wide discussion about the reinvention of the revenue model with, for example, why aren't we looking at a municipal income tax? Property tax is an antiquated model of wealth based on the idea that the bigger your castle, the more money you have. Well, that's not the way it is. Some businesses out there are multi-million dollar businesses on a smartphone, right? We've, our, our economy, the way we do business has evolved. Our municipal revenue model hasn't. So we're still taxing property and it, it's just not how wealth is created. Uh, municipal income tax, just for the record, was actually in place pre-World War II before the feds in the province had it. They saw it and said, hey, that looks like a really good tax. It generates a lot of money. We're going to borrow it for the war. Don't worry, we'll give it back. Didn't. So uh, there is precedent for this in this city. Uh, in, the, in Europe, 75% of their municipal revenue in some cities comes from uh, municipal income taxes. Of course, the mayor has discussed the sales tax idea. These are all elements and 
that, that should be part of the conversation. As a community, we should say, what kind of city do we want and how are we going to fund it? And we're not going to fund it by trying to do a 1% or a half a percentage point tweaking of property taxes. And the same goes for the province. I know we're picking on the city a little bit here. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead. No, good question, fair question. Uh, that's what the, part of the rainy day funds created, right? For those unexpected one-time costs, flood costs, um, those natural disaster kind of situations. That's what it's designed for. Uh, unfortunately, it was rated to pay for systemic deficit that was being created. So ideally, you want to build that up and then use that for when you do run into those situations. Um, again, we're not slaves to the notion of it. There's got to be flexibility for government. In, in business, you have flexibility. You have your business plan and something happens. Oil bottom drops out. Uh, you know, you have the stock market crash. You need to be flexible, you need to be adjusting. But it's, at least have an idea that you have a plan in place and that instead of just, again, and we talk about excuses, and, and, and some are legitimate. I'm not trying to take away from the provincial government, but there is a recognition that after a while, it's, if that's all you're hearing instead of how we're going to turn it around, how we're going to get us back to black. You listen to the narrative as it relates to the deficits. It started off, we will return to black by 2016. Then it started to be, or, sorry, thank you. And then it became, we're, we're committed to getting back by 2016. The last time I met with the finance minister, it was, we, we, we still intend to uh, balance the books one day. Like the narrative's changing, and, and so that really gives business a crisis of confidence. So absolutely, government needs the flexibility. Part of that was why the fiscal stabilization fund was created. Um, but it also speaks to why when the, when the sun is shining, you make hay because there's going to be that time that comes. And the conference board, which we partnered with on May 2nd in delivering a half-day conference event, talking about those reports and so forth, the, the chief economist was very clear. His advice to provincial governments is, when the economy is good, you save. So that when the economy turns down, which it will, and your, uh, your slides demonstrate that quite to the point, that's when you spend. That's when you make stimulus spending and you make strategic investments, not the other way around. Okay, that's just a return though to Keynesian, Keynesian economic system, right? And neoliberalism blew that right out of the water. Did you want to extend or expand on that? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that in, in a way, that the, the provincial government had a plan, right? Which was the balanced budget legislation. Uh, they never really gave the plan a chance. The balanced budget legislation, for example, allows the province to uh, discount extraordinary expenditures like, like flooding, which was a big factor in 10-11. Um, so, uh, it, in a way, they had imposed a plan on themselves, and then as soon as the going became unpleasant, they uh, abandoned it. And uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm a little uh, disappointed just in the, in the way that they've responded to that, that what is their own legislation. Uh, in the 2008 diversion. Yeah, well, no, I won't. I'll leave that to you, sir. Um, I mean, I guess the only thing, I, I, I'm just going to say what you were talking about at the end there about the balanced budget legislation and then how they um, changed that legislation. We can talk about the PST legislation as well. They had to change the requirement there for a referendum. So, I mean, we the people elect a government and then we have to kind of live with the decisions that they make over the course of four years, and that is a part of how this process works. And I think that's where we, as the media, step in to hold them to account and show people and talk about when they're changing legislation or they're changing promises or if timelines um, change, like the original timeline of 2014 to balance, and then 2016-17 uh, now looking like a great idea as opposed to a commitment. Um, I think that that is kind of where we where we come in and we just follow that storyline through. Next question. Yes. Well, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The one thing we've always believed in is, uh, unfortunately, 
there's a bit of a paternalistic relationship that exists between the province and the city that's, that exists regardless of political strife. I mean, the, the Conservatives, NDP, doesn't matter the mayor, it, it's existed. Actually, I was uh, at an event, it was kind of funny. Um, it was Marty Moran's, Council Moran's, when he was speaking to one of our chapters, and he pulled out a 1947, I think it was Tribune, I'm sorry, uh, uh, article, and it was from Councillor John Bloomberg, who was standing up and saying, the city needs to get a better share of its revenue from the province. Like, this is not an issue that's new to us, that we've been fighting for about 100 years. Um, but absolutely, our view is, I would rather the city, and it kind of speaks a little bit to my comment about the, city, the province becoming a half province, allow the city appropriate taxation authority so that it doesn't have to come begging and negotiating to try to get its fair share, but rather has the ability to determine its own fate, set its own taxes, and then be accountable to voters for that. Absolutely, I think uh, it's, it's the future of cities, uh, and it's where we need to go. But again, it's gonna be part of a community conversation. Municipal income tax is one potential option. There, there, there's a whole range of taxing uh, tools um, it won't happen. <laughs> and, and the 1%? Oh, sorry. Uh, the 1% actually, um, you're, you're correct, I believe. I, you know, I shouldn't speak for the business council. I'll let the business council speak for themselves. Uh, with respect to the chamber's position, our view was 1% of the PST should be dedicated to municipal infrastructure. So it didn't have to raise 1%, just dedicate 1%. We do support, uh, drive our roads, whether you take the bus or not, bike, whatever, it's, it's a war zone out there and we, did, we need to make these investments. They're strategic investments and we've come on side saying they needed to be made so we just encourage the province to dedicate that 1%. They, I guess, said, great idea, we'll just do it within another 1%. Next question. Well, most of them actually. Good point. Uh, they, there's seven provinces with balanced budget legislation, and uh, I think uh, all but Saskatchewan had to uh, suspend their legislation. BC will have a balan uh, balanced budget surplus this year. I don't know what they've done with both their balanced budget legislation. Uh, Saskatchewan will also have a surplus this year, uh, but they haven't been ever suspended theirs. There's also questions about how you use the rainy day fund, but my interpretation of that is that it is a, 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 a method of essentially smoothing government expenditures over time, so that uh, it has to be big enough so that you can actually accomplish that. Um, uh, and most provinces, uh, I think, I demonstrated in the paper with Jared Wesley, did not take the kinds of savings actions that would have accomplished that. So Manitoba is certainly not alone in that. Um, uh, I think our circumstances in which we could have survived by following the legislation were probably a little better than provinces like Ontario. But uh, six of the seven provinces uh, bailed on. Um, well, I guess a couple of things. One is that um, I think I don't think the city has the fiscal capacity to address this problem. If it's going to uh, solutions are going to come, at least in the form of spending money. Uh, the city may be a good guide as to how to spend that money, and should be consulted. But I think the money has to come from the province, and in particular from the federal government. Uh, so, uh, you know that that's that that's the reality of the fiscal uh, framework that we. Uh, that we live with. I had another point, but I can't remember it now, so I'll pass. You know, and I, thank you. That was a, a great question because it's always, you know, to um, be it the municipal budget that we're talking about, and there's been issues raised around that, the, the, the notion of whose back is it off of. And I'd like to change the narrative on that one because I really don't subscribe to this idea that it, we have to continually compete one pot against another. The issues you raised are too important for that, and I'm not going to be glib about it. They are real issues, and they're not the only issues. Homelessness, uh, uh, you know, health issues, education. The, the list is endless. But I will say this, and, I'm, and I apologize if this sounds glib in any way, shape, or form, but if money was the simple answer, 
wouldn't we have solved it by now? Like, I'm, I'm just really, think about it. If, if that's all it took, if we just spent enough, what government out there, I don't care your political stripe, is not going to spend the money to solve uh, child poverty, to, that kids don't go home hungry. Like, this is, this is such a, those issues you raised are so complex. And also, I don't subscribe that government's the only one that can do anything about it. Uh, we work extensively with the nonprofit community, the voluntary sector, and I see organizations out there doing tremendous work. Uh, we just did the walk, of course, uh, with Ray, the Reserves for Youth, Assistance for Youth. There are no end of organizations out there doing great work. Why does it have to be government that solves all our problems? You know, um, we need to start believing that there's capacity beyond government. Government is a partner. Government is an important player, is a leader in a lot of these things. But so are you, and so are the organizations out there doing the good work. And, and again, some people might say that and are, are rolling their eyes, but I see it every day and we're part of it. And all I'm saying is we need to continue to work on those issues. There's never going to be an easy answer to it, so I'm not going to give you an easy answer because there is none. But uh, we, we have to keep at it. I don't want it to be a case that someone loses because someone wins. And that's where the revenue model reinvention to me speaks to. Let's stop pitting one group against another. I'm gonna appear at city council on Monday and we're gonna talk to business tax and I guarantee you that's what it's gonna be. It's gonna be this well, business at the expense of everyone else. I wanna change the narrative. We don't need to have that kind of conversation. Thank you.